Welcome to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. This week in the first segment, we are celebrating Media Literacy Week. The National Association for Media Literacy Education has sponsored U.S. Media Literacy Week for the last 10 years. And we at Project Censored are also celebrating Critical Media Literacy Week along with people at NAMLI. Our guest today is no stranger to you. It is Dr. Nolan Higdon. He is a media literacy scholar, author of numerous books, including The Anatomy of Fake News, which is something that we'll be talking about today. He's also co-editor of uh, a recent book on the global crackdown uh, on censorship around the world. He's also done numerous other books, including The United States of Distraction and Let's Agree to Disagree that we co-authored together. And Nolan Higdon, you also travel around the country regularly, and you are a regular guest on numerous media platforms talking about the intersection of politics, current events, and media literacy. Most recently, and for our topic today, uh, our listeners should know that uh, Dr. Higdon put together what's called a brief resource guide to fake news and the 2024 election. Here we are in Media Literacy Week talking with our expert guests about helpful hints for the voting public. So not too late, not armchair quarterbacking. Nolan Higdon is here today to talk to us about uh, issues around so-called fake news, the moral panics that came after the 2016 election regarding misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, the many efforts then that sprang forth to do something or combat fake news. But of course, as listeners to this show know, not all those efforts um, really were equal, and some even may have been more Trojan horses to control content, especially online. Nolan Higdon, welcome back to the Project Censored show uh, during this Media Literacy Week. What's up, Mickey? And what's up, Project Censored Universe? Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's it's always great to talk to you, and it's very timely that at projectcensored.org, you can go to see our resources under the classroom, Project Censored in the Classroom. We've got a lot of free resources for educators and the general public, um, and we want to make sure people have access to this information. And Nolan, a great way to do that is to have you overview this. And you start out by saying the U.S. election is approaching, and with it, a crescendo of anxiety about online lies. You were quoting the Financial Times from August 2024. And of course, in the past decade, weaponization of fake news by political figures like Donald Trump and others, proponents of the Brexit vote um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there were heightened fears about misinformation and those concerns led social media companies to moderate content. It prompted governments, like in the United States, to create boards aimed at curtailing disinformation, what could go wrong, and of course, resulted in academia establishing positions for so-called disinformation experts. Well, look, why don't we just start there? Because there are so many things to unpack in that first paragraph from the introduction to your fake news guide at projectcensored.org. Um, remind our listeners about the fake news um, sort of epidemic and how that came about after the 2016 election, the efforts to combat it, and then why media literacy is really the antidote to this. Nolan Higdon. Yeah, it's well said, Mickey. Uh, you know, coming out of the 2016 election, and let's not forget, it was shortly after the uh, Brexit vote that took place in the UK. Um, a lot of uh, establishment leaders were, were quite frightened about what they were seeing. The public was voting against things that they had sort of established as conventional wisdom, right? That the EU is a good thing for the British, for example, or that, you know, Hillary Clinton is like a political scion who's ready to uh, take over the Democratic Party and the nation. Um, and this is a sign of progress, right? And it is having a woman be able to take over a position that's been dominated by men since its inception. Um, so they sort of were shocked that the public were turning against those things, um, voting for the UK to leave the EU um, or here in the United States, supporting someone like Donald Trump, who seemingly did everything the establishment said you shouldn't do, right? I mean, he was sexist. He was racist. He was outlandish. He was clearly trying to profit. He didn't care that he was lying. Uh, he openly admitted corruption. He said it was smart to avoid taxes. I mean, everything just on down the line, they said, oh, this is it. Donald is cooked. Donald is cooked. Donald is cooked. And then he wins. And I think there was a big uh, egg on your face moment for those in media and the establishment. And the way they coped was trying to find excuses. And they blamed everything from 
progressives trying to blame Susan Sarandon or Bernie Sanders supporters uh, to the Russians were under every bed and responsible. And fake news became a convenient scapegoat because it was something they could argue that the right wing and the left wing and the Russians all were spreading. And that's why uh, the public was manipulated in, into voting for Trump. But it's it's a really uh, anti-democratic argument, right? If you believe in democracy, you believe in the will of the people. You believe the radical idea that, that people can make decisions about what's good for their livelihood and their future. And rather than sort of respecting that and trying to understand it, uh, there was a lot of dismissal of it and fake news became a, a convenient scapegoat to explain it. Uh, having said that, I do want to point out that, that fake news can be problematic, right? We've written about this a ton together and independently about the history of fake news uh, has been, you know, been able to make otherwise good people do horrendous things um, looking at some of these regimes. So it is, it is a problem for democracies and it is a problem for humans, but you can never eradicate it. One thing that's about being a human, we can imagine, we can create. Well, that means we can also imagine and create total BS, uh, things that are not true. So it's part of the human experience. You'll never get rid of fake news. So that's why things like censorship or moderation of content or disinformation boards, uh, these are ridiculous um, th ways to try and combat fake news because you can never get rid of it. All you can do is manage it. And what we've seen historically over and over again, when you empower anybody, whether it be government or uh, big tech, to, to tell you what's true and what's false, they abuse that power. Then they use it as an opportunity to uh, dismiss or sideline any content they find problematic and amplify their fake news or, or propaganda. So that's why if you believe in democracy, the real solution is media literacy. Put the power in the hands of the people to determine the veracity of information for themselves. Uh, don't make them dependent on some outside actor, whether it be government or private industry, who's most likely going to manipulate that power. So Nolan Higdon, also your co-author of a book that we all did uh, called The Media and Me, a critical media literacy guide for young people. Um, and I just want to make sure our listeners know that the guide that we're also referencing online that's uh, there for free on fake news detection as aimed, you know, kind of around the election. This is a guide that it's trying to help citizens determine the veracity of information. It's not something that tells people what to think, but rather it's an effort to share tips on how to think more critically and independently about the accuracy of information that we, the people, are inundated by daily. So can you talk a little bit about that for our audience? What does that look like? Because a lot of these, and we can maybe, maybe you can mention a couple of examples um, of uh, of what we think at Project Censored and in your circles too, um, the approaches to it that are almost more uh, authoritarian or parental in their approach or parochial, you finger wagging, um, you know, fact checking and outsourcing. We're not really fans of that, and we don't we don't think that it's a good idea to just entrust some other third parties to tell us what's true and what's false. So can you talk about that? You know, this is a whole uh, sort of part of our information ecosystem, the fact checkers, right? Can you talk to us about that conundrum and why that's not always the best thing? And then differentiating, how are some things uh, that, what are some things that you have put forward uh, in order to deal with this challenge that are unlike that, that kind of put individuals in the driver's seat of their own minds, their own lives? Yeah, and one of the things I did by creating this guide, I mean, we should be clear, it, it pulls together a lot of work that I and others have done in, in uh, the critical media literacy space. So there's nothing sort of revolutionarily new from other work we've done, but it's accessible, it's free, it's online for those who don't want to buy or read books. This is something they can access quickly. It's, it's set up in a accessible way. So if you have a question like, you know, will AI help us solve the fake news problem, for example, there's an answer to that question on the guide. Um, so I'm trying to give people the information in an accessible and digestible way. And to your point about it's um, how to think and not what to think, we, we I avoid that sort of parental or, or protectionist approach of saying like, these are good news outlets. These are bad news outlets. These are good journalists. These are bad journalists. That's not for me to decide. Um, what I'm trying to do is give you some tips for where you can make those determinations on your own. And in fact, throughout the guide, um, I think I do a pretty good job of balancing examples from right, left, and center of folks who engage in the production of, of fake news. And I, I can tell you personally, I, I run a Substack that has uh, thousands of, of followers, and I can always tell like who signed up when, because when I publish something that critiques the lies of the Republican Party, that's when I get a bunch of hate mail from people who must have signed up because they read a critique of the Democrats. 
And then when I uh, put up a critique of the Democrats, I get a bunch of hate mail from Democrats who must have joined in when they saw me critiquing Republicans. Uh, I always get the, you know, the you're doing other sideism, uh, the, the common complaint that someone raises whenever they're too afraid to say, Nolan, you're right. Um, so for folks who are concerned about that, the the, the brief history guide, it, it tries to do a, a good job of uh, critiquing left, right and center. I don't tell people how to vote or if to vote or what to vote for. Um, that's ultimately up to them. Um, and what it is, is basically just just some tips we've established over the years of questions you should ask when you uh, come into contact with different content or um, it's things that if you see, they should at least tell you to stop reasons to be skeptical. So when it comes to, to questions, you know, it's asking questions like who published this? Who's the publisher, like the company or news outlet? What are their conflicts of interest? Um, you know, who's the author? What are their conflicts of interest? Who are, do they have sources? If so, who are their sources? What potential sources might be missing? Um, you know, those are kind of the, the questions I encourage um, folks to ask uh, about content they see. And then I also raise in the, the brief history guide, warning signs, things that when you start to see them um, and feel you're being gaslit, um, chances are you you probably are being gaslit. So when the facts change, right? When, when uh, for example, in late 2020, when you have Democrats like Kamala Harris out there saying like she wouldn't trust taking the vaccine because Trump ran it through too fast. And then, she, you know, Biden gets elected and she changes her scripts. Now it's a pandemic of the unvaccinated and, and she can't believe people won't take the safe vaccine. Um, that, that's a that's a switch. That's a major switch that leaves people confused where they are, where do they stand ideologically or politically? I want to I say in moments like that, folks should pause, do some deeper research. Uh, whenever the script changes like that, uh, that's usually a sign that that you're trying to be manipulated one way um, or another. So I have a lot of examples like that um, throughout the the guide. And in addition, the guide ends with a list of other um, organizations, some I'm affiliated with, some non that I highly recommend. These are folks that are independent of corporate funding that do great work in the critical media literacy space for parents for students, for teachers, for community groups. Um, we've got a lot of those resources out there. So Nolan Higdon, we're talking about a brief resource guide to fake news in the 2024 election, helpful hints for the voting public. And you, you also talk about where fake news comes from, where propaganda comes from. What, 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 are, what are some of the, the sources? Because when, when, when that question comes forward, it seems like there's a public assumption uh, that it only comes from from uh, Russia uh, or foreign governments or or these places, and of course it does and can. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that it does not, but you give us a more comprehensive list with evidence uh, that basically it seems as though that it can kind of come from anywhere. Nolan Higdon. Yeah, we're about 15 or 20 years into an information war. Um, the American public seemed to to really sort of grasp that only about five, 10 years ago, but. Um, we've been in a war. And, and by the way, this isn't coming from like lefty scholars in the academic space. These are people in like the defense industry have been warning about this for 15 or 20 years. That, the Rand Corporation and yeah. their truth decay, right? Yes. Yeah. And they're, you know, they've been warning about the fact that foreign actors can use uh, the Internet, among other communication tools to manipulate audiences against the interests of a foreign nation. And um, the and so, yeah, nations like Russia absolutely do that. They've been caught red handed. That's very clear. Um, so has Iran, so has China, but here's the part, so has the United States. And they not only send that um, false information internationally, they also send it here domestically. It can boomerang and come back domestically. So I don't take people seriously when they're only focused on the Russian fake news problem. Um, you, you have to throw China, Iran, the United States, Israel's a major actor. You have to sh throw all of these nations in if you're really serious about combating false information. When you cherry pick the country, uh, you're not a really serious or sophisticated person. So I think governments are one producers of fake news that, that you sort of mentioned. And I think most people can grasp that. Like we have a long history in this country of being skeptical about government. So I don't think that that's too revolutionary to a lot of people. But um, where, I, where I think we also have people are mostly aware is that corporations also um, spread fake news as well. And I talk about in the document how you know, the sugar industry tried to absolve itself of, of being responsible for any negative health outcomes and blame it all on fat for years of fake studies. Fossil fuel put out fake studies arguing that climate change wasn't human created, even though their internal studies said the opposite. So I think people know that about corporations. I think people know that po politicians and political campaigns make fake content, whether it be Democrats or Republicans. Um, they make false content, uh, to, you know, to get themselves elected and, and marginalize their opponent. Um, I think people also know 
quite well that that individuals uh, make up fake news, uh, you know, for a multitude of reasons. I often use the example of Susan Smith, who was a white woman who murdered her children, and she blamed, said her children had been kidnapped by a black man. So people were out searching for this non-existent black kidnapper. She did that to cover up a, a murder. Um, folks like Alex Jones, on the other hand, they've, you know, created a career out of making fake news to make profits, right? He would create fake news to scare you about something like Y2K and then cut to a commercial to sell you a product to deal with it. Again, I think folks know that. Where I think um, the one part that might be most controversial uh, where I talk about fake news producers, and I say it's controversial because I know personally I've gotten a lot of pushback and debates about this. And Mickey, I know you have too. We've, we've talked about this as well, which is corporate news media also produces false information um, that is spread publicly. And sometimes this is done to be fair to them. Sometimes it's they spread misinformation, meaning they unintentionally do it. Um, so I point out how like, the AP reported uh, shortly after 9-11 that they were getting reports that Muslims were dancing in the street. It turned out to be false. There was no evidence Muslims were dancing in the street. But the fact that they reported that they were hearing that, that then became a, a fake news meme. People to this day still say Muslims were celebrating the street, which there's no evidence to corroborate that. But then other times, I, I have to believe that it's done intentionally. Um, I look at the, the lies of, of Russiagate that were like easily dispelled by corporate media claiming that the Russians had shut down a Vermont power plant or put a bounty on U.S. soldiers or created Havana syndrome or released the created the Hunter Biden laptop content. Like all, all those things turned out to be false or the WMD story that they all um, amplified uh, that led us to war um, later on proved to be false. Uh, conservative media, we know without a doubt, amplified the lie that the 2020 election was stolen because we have text messages inside Fox where they said, we know it wasn't stolen, but our audience wants it to be stolen. So we're going to keep having guests on who say it's stolen, even though they were insulting these people, calling them stupid rubes for believing it was stolen. They were still sending content their way. So, it, you know, and that's just a couple examples off the top of my head. But time and time again, our supposed news media spreads false information. And this is what makes fighting the fake news problem difficult is we're trying to convince people to have credibility in news media because there are good journalists in this country doing great work and we do need them for a democracy. But a lot of our most well-known news outlets have lost credibility for good reason. And so it's, it's a tough balancing act we have in the media literacy world to try and guide people toward credible sources and good journalism um, without getting them caught up in the fake news of a lot of corporate media. Hey, Nolan Higdon, you mentioned Fox in the Dominion case. Basically, that was uh, where Fox knowingly was misleading the public, spreading disinformation. Um, and they paid $787 million for the right to do so, basically, to avoid a guilty verdict in a settlement. Uh, so so factually, we can't say they're guilty in in, in a legal context. But everybody who you know has an open mind and can look at the evidence would know that that's exactly what they did, right? In other words, um, you know, basically like a fine, it's almost like a fine or something. It's like, it's not really a legal issue if you can afford to do it. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. And, and so that can, I mean, that does contribute to the declining trust or the, the lack of trust in these establishment news outlets. And it's, of course, not just Fox, MSNBC, um, you know, has numerous examples of of doubling down on Russia Gate, CNN, uh, you know, basically smearing uh, the only Palestinian American member of Congress with with falsehood, taking no accountability for it. Um, back to MSNBC, uh, they're silencing and letting go of certain journalists that were reporting facts that they would just rather not have out to the public around the Israeli attacks on Gaza after October seven. I mean, we could go on and on and on here. Um, but the point is, is that there is a noted de decline in trust in the American public of our major media institutions. And you've mentioned it earlier. I'll say it again. Based on the track record, that's unfortunately deserved in, in, in large part. This does not mean that the corporate media, the established press never reports anything good. It doesn't mean there aren't great reporters there, which you just said. So I want to repeat that. Mm -hmm. It's it's a gray area. It's it's not like a black and white thing, um, and and of course we like to send people to independent media, right? Independent sites where you can get perspectives and things that are either left out in the corporate press or distorted. Which, by the way, leads us to one more term I want to get to before the break, and that's malinformation. <laughs> so I know that one's fun. Um, basically, that's partial information with not full context. I mean, what we at Project Censored. 
Peter Phillips coined the term news abuse over more than 20 years ago. And news abuse is a kind of propaganda that presents partial truths as full stories, absent historical context or other details. Isn't that what malinformation is? I mean, this isn't new either. Yeah, it, it, that's so true. I mean, yeah, malinformation by by definition is introducing uh, true content but without the context to, to properly understand it, which, yeah, exactly is what news abuse is. But my, my problem with the malinformation term, I, I've tried to avoid it for this reason. I mean, malinformation, as we just described, it clearly exists. And, and uh, Peter Phillips and yourself and the others Project Censor have done great work documenting that for, for decades at, at this point. But my problem with it is, is um, the subjective nature of which context. So what we have now is this uh, unfortunate practice in media where they say, well, it's malinformation. We have to admit it's true. But we think if you believed it, if you believe this, this and this, you would interpret it this way. And, and that's simply just just too subjective for me to be comfortable. And for, for an example, I mean, go back. This is a loss to history now about six months ago. But you remember um, Joe Biden was at that uh, memorial for D-Day in France, and um, there was a video of him seemingly looking lost walking away from what was going on and the video was repeated shown over and over again in conservative media as an example of how uh joe biden is experiencing cognitive issues and in the democratic leaning media like msnbc morning joe they called it malinformation they said yeah he's walking off but but he knows what he's doing and he's going over there to check on this person who landed so the, the right wing is this is just they're spreading malinformation well, fast forward like three months later, everybody in media is saying like, yeah, Biden does have some cognitive decline. Um, you know, we, we, we he, he can't run for uh, president. He can somehow serve another uh, six months as president, but he can't serve. He can't run for president um, again. And, and I, I thought that was a really uh, revealing case of how the malinformation label was trying to silence or discredit people who are asking credible questions about Biden, which gets back to what we were talking about with credibility in news media, if we do have a free press that's not biased, that, that's willing to ask any questions, how is it for three and a half plus years, the independent press was raising questions about Biden's cognitive ability. The corporate media were saying things like, I don't care if he poops his pants, we're running for him. Joe Scarborough said F you to anybody who questions his cognitive abilities. And then all of a sudden, the entire establishment agrees with what's been said for the last three and a half years. I think that's an indictment of the media. They're not covering the most powerful person, the president of the United States, and being honest with the public, or they're so inept at their job, they missed what was right under their nose. Either way, I mean, that's a big failure and a big reason why people don't have credibility in the press. Nolan Hig, that I wanted to go back to, since we were talking about the problems of fake news and propaganda, declining trust in media, let's also realize that Fake news is a, a threat. It is a problem because if people are not media literate or unquestionably accept things that they think is a trustworthy source, may, maybe maybe helped along with their confirmation bias so they don't challenge it, it can lead to damaging, dangerous things, even life-threatening things. So we're not making light of this and we're not pretending that people are stupid Right. That, that's often something that another way that it can be scoffed off is like, well, these people are are just too dumb or too ignorant. They just don't understand. Well, the antidote to that is clearly education, not outsourcing it to others. But can you, you and you talk about this in your fake news book and your guide. Talk a little bit about the, you know, the seriousness of it so people understand that it is something that's worth our attention. But that means it's even more important to figure out what to do about it. Nolan Higdon. Yeah, I always think the, the threat of fake news, in my opinion, is that uh, it can make otherwise good people do terrible things. Um, and, you know, I, I like to I think a prime example of that that I like to cite is the, the so-called Pizzagate controversy, where um, you had a father who read online about uh, the Democratic Party uh, molesting children in a pizza restaurant in D.C. The story is absolutely false. There's no evidence to support it. But regardless, he didn't know that. And he read it. And he drove down from North Carolina to D.C. and uh, he fired a gun um, in the air at this pizza restaurant. And he thought he was liberating children. And I, I like to tell this story because on the one hand, like you said, some people read it as look at this stupid like gun toting maniac firing a gun in a restaurant. And I, I get that perspective. But I also have to say, like, I don't know if the story were true, which it was not. And I'm not entertaining that, but say it was true. Um, this guy would be a hero. Here's someone put his life on the line to rescue children who are being abused. And then I think it's an encapsulation of the problem with fake news. Uh, it They pull on things that we know are true and get us outraged, right? Pedophilia is something that outrages us, something we would all like to, to stop. Um, but And sex trafficking we, is an issue. I mean, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. 
These are yeah. issues, but just not in the way that it's being described. Exactly. And so it, it pulls on real things people are thinking about um, and it, it abuses people. I mean, this is like the people who stormed the Capitol. Again, the election was not stolen, but let's assume it was for, for the sake of argument, as these people did. They thought they were protecting democracy. Who wouldn't give their life for democracy? So I like to go to these examples to say, like, the, the problem with fake news is it not necessarily the, the people. The people have good values use in, in many cases, right? It's democracy, anti-pedophilia. But the news media preys on, on those moral positions and gets people to do immoral things like break into a Capitol and, and stomp people and kill people or uh, shoot up a, a restaurant. That's the problem with fake news. Well, and Nolan Higdon, you know, you recently were at Ithaca College with me at Park Center for Independent Media doing an event called Disinformation Nation, where we talked about this. And you and I wrote a piece for, for um, Park Indy Media called... Um, Manufacturing outrage one pet at a time, disinformation, hyperpartisan media, and the perils of big tech. And of course, we were alluding to the, the recent fiasco about Trump's claims echoed further by vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance during the last presidential debate with uh, Kamala Harris. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the cats. They're, they're eating your pets. Um, I mean, for, for, for an, an adult human that's running for president as former president, to spread such nonsense on national television like this um, and, and have it actually be greeted with some kind of sobriety instead of the lunacy it was. And it was even proven to be nonsensical, but J.D. Vance doubled down. And he said, if I have to create stories so that the American media actually pay attention to the suffering of the American people, then that's what I'm going to do. He said that to Dana Bash at CNN, Nolan Higdon. Yeah, th this was a weird... One of those weird moments where someone says the quiet part out loud and it's good to, to document that, um, you know, clearly they're, they're trying to attract a voting base uh, that has a, a xenophobic approach to immigrants. They're afraid of um, folks who are born in other countries coming to the United States. Uh, there's also those who have uh, economics con uh, anxiety. So they're worried about competing with jobs from people outside of the United States. And then um, there are folks who have infrastructure questions, right? They already are concerned about traffic and things like that. They're worried about immigrants. So, you know, some of those concerns may be legitimate, some some not, that that's up to for the voters to decide. But I think what, what J.D. Vance was saying was, as a way to kind of tie all those interests into one story and draw, draw attention to our campaign from those voters, I'm going to manufacture a story and I'm going to beat it home and it's going to be something so sensationalistic and outlandish that the press is going to have um, no choice but to cover it. And by covering it, that's going to draw more attention to the issue. It's going to draw more attention to my campaign and hopefully energize voters. So I think that was the strategy that, that J.D. Vance was, was sort of um, describing there. But the reason why it's such a valuable admission is he's, he's letting the game go, that these politicians do not care about the veracity of information. Uh, they're not interested in truth. They're interested in what plays well, what motivates voters to get out and support them or demotivate voters who, are, who are, would otherwise turn out to vote against them. And so I thought it was a really interesting admission of how politicians see the utility of fake news in their campaigns. So Nolan Higdon, in your fake news guide, I want to reiterate something that you mentioned earlier in our conversation um, as we're coming up. So you have a few minutes left in this segment. And, and I do like to end, as you and I and the many things that we do together and, and so forth, we, we, we like to end with more than just a sentence or a paragraph about things you can do or where the antidotes are. And we believe strongly in critical media literacy education. And here we are for Media Literacy Week, right, October 20, 21 to 25, um, you have a list of things that we can do, resisting the pressure to click like and share without thinking about things. You talk about the importance of slowing down. We live in a speed up world where everything technologically is so fast, right? Um, you know, and as I like to always go back to Jonathan Swift from 1710 and say, falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it. Well, that seems more true today than ever with how fast things fly around. But you also talk about people being aware of their own biases, confirmation bias. Don't just accept polling at face value. You know, ask questions about it. Um, be aware of deep fakes, AI, selective editing. Um, you know, again, thinking independently, interrogate party stories. Like you talk about just because you might be a Republican doesn't mean everything they're saying is true and vice versa. If you're a Democrat, it doesn't mean everything they're saying is true. You know, you also remind us of sort of the dog whistles of American politics, 
like racism, right? And I mean, you know, we could get into this, but there, there seems to be that going on with both the major parties. I mean, even though it looks like Trump is often uh, dog whistling through a bullhorn, um, you know, the Harris campaign and, and the comments that they've recently made about the leader of Hamas that was killed um, and how they think that's a great thing. I mean, I'm not sure that plays well uh, with all the voters, especially the significant uncommitted voters that are in swing states that the Democrats really need these people of color, many of them. Um, so you, you go about, through a long list of these things, about, and I think uh, it's really important to remember that, but go ahead, Nolan. Yeah, yeah. how about, um, yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Like, uh, the, the news media, I think, has not served the, the Democratic Party audience well. The, the uncommitted voters, folks who are frustrated with the Biden administration's position on Gaza, they're not going away, and they remain a major threat to the Harris campaign. And, and Harris has largely been able to avoid um, having to seriously talk about that, that topic beyond, you know, the topic talking points of, we want a two-state solution, we want a ceasefire. Um, but no, no on how she's going to do it. But I would also say there's another big demographic that speaks to um, the ways in which we've had the dog whistles of, of race. I, I was stunned at Barack Obama and this campaign for sort of finger wagging at black men right. for not supporting Harris. I, I want to be very clear. The statistics are clear. Whites are the majority of the electorate in this country and she's losing all men. So a much bigger demographic that she's losing in terms of gender is white men. Why we're, we're wagging our finger at, at black men. I think speaks to a racist sentiment in this country that that they're and almost sexist. like objects we can transfer and it's sexist. sexist too because we lose yeah yeah Democrats have or yeah Democrats have lost white women in the last three presidential right. elections right. too which is another part of that um, so I, I yeah I, I think that um, the way we talk it, it speaks to the ways in which we talk about these groups way too simply so it's like black voters do this uh, Michigan voters do that people are way more complex than that and and this sort of finger wagging at people saying. You know, you need to, it's it's your fault for not voting for the party. That's the exact opposite of how democracy is supposed to work. You're supposed to do everything you can to give us a reason to vote for you. You're not supposed to finger wag at us and tell us that it's our fault for not voting for you. Yeah, it's again, um, we, we live in strange times, you know, a, a time even when the word weird has been adopted uh, <laughs> by, by the Democratic Party to sort of be an analytical stand-in for for what they don't like about the Republican candidates. And I mean, it really just, again, it is like the Trumpization, right? As you and I wrote about in the United States of Distraction, even if Trump was gone, which he isn't, uh, but you wouldn't know that from the media. They're constantly just, he sucks the air right out of the room and gaslights with impunity. And they kind of, they don't just let him do it, they amplify it, you know, in a lot of ways. And And I think that's why we also see this declining trust. But last point, there are trustworthy media literacy organizations and resources uh, that we like to share with people. And of course, Media Literacy Week is sponsored by NAMLI, National Association for Media Literacy Education, and NAMLI.org is one of those. And we want to give a big shout out to our friend and colleague at Project Look Sharp, uh, Cindy Scheib, who just won a major award from NAMLI. Um, Project Look Sharp is another media literacy organization that does uh, great work. But Nolan, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some other places to go uh, where we can get help with our media literacy uh, education. Well, well, certainly, uh, if you are a educator, a student, or just a uh, media user in general uh, wanting to mo know more, you should definitely go to projectcensored.org, longest continuously running media organization. I know this audience won't be shocked that I start with that, but it always bears repeating. Um, and then I think, you know, uh, a resource I like to turn people to if you're a community member or parent and you were thinking, you know, what are some resources to get some ideas about how to talk about this with my community or my kids? Um, to check out uh, USC's Critical Media Project. It has a litany of free resources. Um, and it, I think there's a lot of nice companion and overlap with our Media and Me book, which is also addressed for young people as well. So I recommend that. Um, if you're a teacher looking for resources on all things media literacy, whether it be news or environment or pop culture, race and representation, whatever, um, Jeff Scher uh, from UCLA put together the Education 466 Library Guide, which you can access through UCLA's website, or you can get it on the, the Brief History Guide as well. But there's a lot of great organizations too, um, like Prop Watch is out there and Veridity and, and others. So we, I put a lot of those resources up. And one of the things I want to emphasize why I, I recommend the resources uh, in the guide versus some other ones that are out there. These are folks who don't take corporate funding. Th these are folks who work in the educational and nonprofit spaces. Uh, they, they spend their lives and exhaust themselves just trying to get people to be more media literate. They're not trying to make a profit. 
or live in some high-end environment with fancy cocktail parties and celebrities. Uh, these are folks who are actually just promote media literacy. So you can trust that they're coming from a place that, that really wants to strengthen democracy and, and help the public get better informed. Uh, they're not looking to make a profit. And yeah, Nolan Higdon, you know, that's important to note. Just like we need independent public interest journalism that practices ethical journalism, like the Society of Professional Journalists uh, promote the code of ethics, we also need critical media literacy, pedagogy, and education in the public interest, like you're describing right here. And the organizations you mentioned, like Verity, which is part of Improve the News Foundation, Prop Watch, or the Prop Watch Project, of course, our friends at Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, right? Uh, FAIR and their counterspin uh, program here on Pacifica Radio. There's a number of these, and even the Park Center for Independent Media that highlights these things. There are really great resources that are out there and available, and they often produce free, a free, widely available information to the public. You just have to know where to find it, right? And of course, one of the things we do here at the Project Censored Show is we hope that we have a map that, that we're helping people find these things. And Nolan Hang did your scholarship and the work you do, um, being as prolific as it is, um, you're really trying to get the word out there and show people that these resources exist and that media literacy truly is for everyone. And I'd like to end on that note, celebrating media literacy this week. Um, we've been joined by our host, Nolan Higdon, uh, professor, author, uh, media scholar who travels all around the country and does fabulous work. Nolan, can you share uh, for our listeners a place they can find more of your work or get in touch with you if they so desire? Yeah, um, I have a Substack, which for folks who don't know, Substack, whenever I publish something, it, it sends it to your email uh, and, uh, you know, publish you know, about once a week or once every two weeks. And it's my name, Nolan Higdon, N-O-L-A-N-H-I-G as in good, D as in David, O-N dot Substack dot com. And you can register there and it's absolutely free. I don't ask for any money. And if you want um, more media literacy resources or media analysis in real time, register at Nolan Higdon dot Substack dot com. Absolutely. And in the name of Media Literacy Week, I also want to remind our listeners, you can go and check out a fantastic frame checking guide by the Associate Director at Project Censored, Andy Lee Roth, and our print digital editor, Shaley Voidel, and of course, our Decoding Democracy series that takes a look at the importance of independent media and media literacy um, as we are approaching election 2024 to make sure people are being accurately informed and are asking critical questions. Dr. Nolan Higdon, thank you so much once again for joining us on the Project Censored show today. Thank you to everybody and thank you, Mickey.